thanks for the uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking at this uh, symposium, and I think uh, Sandra and Cornelia have done a fantastic job organising. So I think we should give them a, a quick uh, a quick hand. So for, for the next few moments, I'm going to be sharing how to how to get uh, fast uh, fast feedback on your research, and I think by taking this approach it can actually give you an enormous advantage against other people. Uh, we actually heard in the previous talk how um, labs who are doing the, the conventional way of doing research may have a certain advantage, but I think if you actually adopt open science practices, you can actually get a, an unfair advantage against people who are doing it through the old way. Now, I'm going to start off with a, with a, with a story. Um, when I was uh, studying uh, undergraduate um, I worked in an Apple store. Um, this is about 10 years ago, so it wasn't as cool as it was uh, as it is now. But back then, in that time, um, of course, we were selling laptops, we were selling computers, but we also sold um, software. But the software came in, in boxes and CDs, and it's kind of quaint when you think about it. When you go and buy laptops now, most laptops don't even have a CD drive. But back in that time, when we were selling, um, when we were selling software, it actually came in a particular box, and that's what we did. Um, but when you actually think from the perspective of the software maker, um, this was incredibly risky, incredibly slow. You'd have an idea, you'd want to you'd put your software out there, um, but then it would take you know, a year of development, um, and then you, you, you finally ship it out to all the stores, people buy it, and only a year or two later do you actually get feedback on whether people actually like this software. Do the reviewers like it? Do the users like it? This process is, is slow and risky. Now, it's a lot different. Um, a lot of stuff is produced in apps. Um, we have stuff on smartphones. We have stuff on our computers. It's all, it's all online. Um, and to, to, to give an example of, of, of Facebook, for instance, the way Facebook works is that software development is actually a lot less risky. They do something which is called, which is releasing a minimum viable product. So if they have an idea, Let's say, um, you know, five, ten years ago, they wanted to re release um, this idea of we want people to organise events on our platform. They noticed that people, when they were writing, they were writing on people's walls, they would go, "Hey, do you want to have drinks on a Friday?" And they were noticing, well, why don't we actually start doing a thing, uh, start doing an app within Facebook where we can, where we can organise events? So rather than actually going to the trouble of doing the old way of let's build this entire thing and hope people like it, they release a small little snippet, a small little feature like a, a small little app of whether you want to actually go to an event. And then they notice people like it. They roll it out. They roll it out to more and more people. Um, they do different features, different A-B tests, different colors, different features, and they can see what works. And they're getting rapid feedback because they can actually put these little snippets out there, different segments, different ages, to see what people actually like. So right now, software development is, um, is fast and less risky. But I'm not here to talk about software development, well, a little bit about software, but not much. I'm here to talk about the publication system. And the publication system that we have now is slow and risky. When we think about it, like we're, we're, we're the academics. We're meant to be the smart ones. But the way that we actually have a publication system is incredibly slow. slow. We know how it all is. We, we work on a paper. We have an idea. We think, OK, this is going to be fantastic. We go through our, we go through our, our institutional review boards. We do all this work. Um, we, we, recruit, we, we recruit our participants, we test them, we do all that, but the, but the work's not over. We submit our paper to a, to, a, to a journal, and they send it back to you because the formatting's not right. Then you try again, and then they send it out, and you get rejected. And this process goes on and on and on. So you have a situation where you're not actually getting feedback on your work till years after you've actually discovered, uh, after you've actually thought of, of the particular problem. Um, and and, and this, is, this is a massive issue. So right now, we have this publication system, which is incredibly slow and incredibly risky. You can come up with an idea, and maybe no one actually cites it. Um, I mean, uh, of course, citations are one of many ways that you can measure impact, but this is one of the ways that we're doing that. You put all this work in, and no one cites it. And there's, on, there's only a finite amount of resources that we can actually depend on what we're going to be doing for our research. So it's important that we actually remove as much risk as possible. We have, we have a model like Facebook, where they're continually testing and continually getting extra feedback on figuring out what's going to work. And then we have academia, where you can only assess impact years after you come out, uh, years after you actually come up with your idea. So, 
Um, what I'm going to be showing you is how you can use open science practices to get fast feedback on your work. And like I said before, this can give you, this can give you a considerable advantage against uh, the people that you work with and against your competitors who aren't necessarily using open science practices. So I want to share my, my fast feedback experience, what opened my eyes, my, my road to Damascus moment when it came to getting fast feedback. Um, about three years ago, I started getting really interested in, in Bayesian hypothesis testing as a way to, to look at the relative evidence for a null model. Um, and I looked into it and I thought this, this can be, I looked into it and I thought this, this can be really cool. And then what I did was I presented, did a little presentation to my lab. It was 10, 15 people. They seemed to enjoy it. They seemed to get a lot out of it. So I thought, well, why don't I actually post this online? Why don't I post the slides on Open Science Framework, post a link to Twitter and see what happens? And then there was a lot of interest in this. I thought, this is great. People seem to be, people seem to be liking it. People were sharing it. People were giving me feedback going, this is clear. This is great. This is exactly what I need. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I should actually develop this a little bit more. Um, and so I posted this as a, as a preprint, and it got uh, an incredible amount of, of, of attention. It got a lot of feedback. Some of it told me I was wrong, um, which was actually, actually, when you think about it, I would much rather learn that I was wrong during the preprint stage than during a publication stage or, or after it's published. So many times you can actually publish stuff and reviewers completely miss things. They're not an expert in everything. Um, and then only after it's published, someone can say that's wrong. And, and we, we all know how hard and how difficult it can be dealing with a retraction or we want to avoid that. So I would much rather be told that I was wrong during a preprint stage than after publication. So although getting told wrong publicly can hurt and can be a little bit embarrassing, I'd much rather that embarrassment than the embarrassment of actually retracting or correcting a paper. So this was preprinted. I got a lot of feedback. I was able to improve it. Um, this increased the profile of the actual paper. Um, um, un unfortunately, my co-author my original co author on the paper had to leave the industry, so he wasn't able to continue working on the paper. But then one of the people that actually commented on the paper, I'm like, hey, my co author's leaving, can you actually contribute? And he said yes. So I actually found a co author via Twitter and via the preprint. Um, so eventually, by doing this, I was able to, to, to publish the paper, it got published. Um, now it's got a ton of citations, which is, which is really encouraging. But at the same time, the reason that I actually got to that end point was I, I was able to get feedback along every single stage that this paper actually would have some interest there by using Twitter, by using blog posts, by using this type of interest. Basically, uh, there's this model that, that I've put together with the, the fast feedback funnel where you can actually get feedback along every step of the way. And of course, the higher up the funnel you are, the quicker your feedback gets. Um, the, quite often what I'll do is I'll have an idea and I'll post it on Twitter and people will go, that's actually quite silly. Um, and it, it's, it's fine, like, I'll, I actually prefer people tell me that I'm wrong, will tell me that I'm wrong rather than stroking my ego to go, this is great when it's not. So, so many times I've had an idea and then someone from a different field is going, oh, you haven't actually considered this. That's actually not a good idea. And I'm like, okay, cool, I'll abandon that. So that saved me months of work, potentially going down a, a, a bad track. But at the same time, I might have an idea, share it on there, and people can go, this is good, this is useful. And then from there, you can go to a blog post where you can actually expand your ideas a bit more. And then from there, you can go to a preprint where you can release the actual manuscript as well as the script and the analysis code until you finally get to the manuscript stage. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over these three top ones because manuscripts, we all know how to do manuscripts, but I'm going to go over social media, blog posts, and preprints. Social media. Um, when it comes to social media, I think people um, overcomplicate this. People think about there's certain formulas. You have, to, you have to tweet at a certain time of day. You have to do these sort of things. You have to include these hashtags. You have to include these keywords. But I really think that when it comes to, to social media, to, to do it well and to bring the most value, it comes, it comes down to two things. And that the best way to bring value on social media is either to educate or to entertain. That's it. It's as simple as that. It's either education or entertainment. To break this down a bit more, when you think about why people use social media, it's either to pass the time, um, they're, they're on the train, they're on the tube, on, on, the, on the way to work, um, they're... Um, watching the, the 40th episode of their toddler's TV show that they don't, they don't want to see again, and they want to pass the time. Or they want to save time. They want to, they want to understand a particular concept, understand how to, how to get better at a particular thing, better at a particular tool to stay up to date with the literature. So what that means is to bring value on social media, you either need to help people pass the time, you need to entertain them, or you need to help people save time. Now, um, entertainment is hard. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend 
doing this as your main strategy, unless you, unless you are already funny, unless you're already entertaining. Um, so, some people have visually interesting research. They have like really cool photos of cells in the brain, and that's great, and you can share that, and people like doing, like, like doing that. But one thing that we can all do as researchers, we can all educate. Every single person here has something important to share. You might think, oh, my, my research is too niche. No, 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 someone out there, if, if, a, if a journal is gonna accept your paper, there's a group of people out there who are gonna be interested in your research and in your tools. Every single person here has the opportunity to actually educate and share what they are working on. Um, the, the thing I love about social media is that it reduces gatekeeping. About 15, 20 years ago, the, the only way that you can get your ideas out there in an academic sense was to either get published in a journal or get invited to talks or to, to conferences or to lectures or to seminars or, or what have you. But at the same, t but at the same time, um, those things are controlled by a very small group of gatekeepers who decide which sort of papers should be published, who decide who should be talking at particular events. And it, it becomes extremely difficult for younger people coming up to actually share their ideas. Now, there, there, are, there are four ways to actually get your research known. One of them is to already be famous. Um, one of them is to have an already famous mentor. Um, the other way is to repeatedly win the publication lottery. But the fourth way is to actively contribute to social media. And that's something that every one of us here can do. You might not be famous, you might not have the famous mentor, um, you might not have had an incredible amount of luck with your publications, but every single person here can actively contribute to social media where you can actually share your ideas. There's nothing stopping you from sharing your ideas. There's plenty stopping you from sharing your ideas in a publication sense um, and when it comes to conferences because you have gatekeepers stopping you. But when it comes to social media and blogging, there is nothing stopping you from sharing your ideas. Now, I want to quickly address some, some common ob objections to social media. Um, the first one is, well, I don't have the time. Um, look, I, I get that people are busy, but when you're saying I don't have the time, what you're really saying is I don't, I don't prioritize that. I don't, want to put a, I, don't, I don't want to prioritize my time on doing that thing. I think social media is, is such an incredible, social media is, is such an incredible, is, is such an important investment of your time, especially when you're an academic. Um, right now, when we're looking at, the, looking at journalists, to say that there's a journalist who isn't on social media is kind of ridiculous. Maybe five years ago you wouldn't think so, but now that's the case. But when it comes to academia, I think in five to ten years' time, every single academic is actually going to be distributing and sharing, and sharing the work on social media. So to say that you don't have the time is really saying, well, it's not a priority. But I would argue that it, it should be an important priority for your work, not only for communicating with other researchers, but also with communicating with the public, because the public can actually see what you're talking about. I, I always say that, that Twitter is like a like, like, like coffee machine. So many ideas are shared at the coffee machine at work, but Twitter actually gives you the opportunity to eavesdrop at that coffee machine or to eavesdrop over those coffee machine conversations. Um, the second one is, well, I don't know how to use it. Um, I, I think this is another sort of weak weak excuse. Um, so many tools that we use are incredibly, incredibly hard. I still don't know how to use MATLAB. So many of these tools are, are so hard to use, but they're tools that we, that we have to use for our research. I would argue that Twitter is just another tool to use. There's an enormous amount of resources out there on how to do it, um, so I would recommend that. And of course, I'm talking a lot about Twitter because that's where researchers predominantly are working on. Of course, there's some bit of work on, on Facebook as well. Um, and of course, there's, there's, there's podcasts too, but I'm mainly talking about Twitter here. Um, the next one is, well, oh, social media is a fad, or these platforms are fad. Look at MySpace. MySpace is dead. No one uses that anymore. Um, and look, I, I, I honestly, I, I don't care if Twitter dies next year. I, I have no particular romance with, with Twitter. It's basically just the, the, the tool that everyone's using now. That's where everyone's attention is now. Um, so no matter what tool is happening now is where you should be right now. And the thing is, you can always transfer what you're doing to the next platform. There's always going to be a next platform, but no matter what, there's always going to be three things. It's always going to be text, it's always going to be images, and it's always going to be audio. I don't, I don't know how this has changed in 10 years' time, what sort of platform is going to be out there, but it's always going to be those three things. And once you actually work on either text, audio, um, or, 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 or video, or images, then you can always transfer that to the new platforms. Um, the people who are killing it on Instagram are the same people who are going to be killing it on TikTok in, in, five, in, in five years' time. These things move across. Uh, so the final one is, I don't have any research to share. Um, well, if that was the case, I would only do three or four tweets a year if all, all I was tweeting was, here is my paper. It's all about the process. I think the process is far more interesting. There's a lot of people who all they tweet about is, here is our paper. I'm like, that's great, but I want to hear about the process. 
I want to hear about the, 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 the failures. I want to hear about the time that R crashed after you were running your analysis for, for, for half an hour. These things are interesting and people want to hear this. People want to hear the human behind the researcher. So you always have some your outcomes. Now, next thing is, um, is blog posts. So there's, there's only so many hours you can work a day. There's only so many emails you can respond to. But the beauty of blog posts and the beauty of audio like podcasts is that these things work 24-7. People can read your blogs whenever they want, not just when you're, when you're available. Um, so it, it brings you an incredible bang for your buck to actually set that up. And doing that, um, th th there's a number of different platforms that you can do, but if you really want to get into it and you're not sure where, um, Medium is, is a great start for, for a free blog. It's super easy. You get set up within sort of two or three minutes. It looks really nice, and writing it, it looks amazing. Adding images is really good. Um, but of course, it's a for-profit platform. We don't know, know um, who owns it. We don't know where it's going to be in two or three years' time. So there's a few risks there. But if you just want to get started, um, Medium is a great um, opportunity. And they, they have good metrics as well. You can see who's reading your, who's reading your work and from where. And, and sometimes, um, yeah, they, they've, they've got a good algorithm. So if someone's writing a similar piece to you, let's say about p-values at the bottom, say, here are some other articles on p-value. So I get actually a lot of reads from different related articles. So Medium can work quite well. Um, what I recommend is that um, you can actually build your own website in under an hour. I've written a, a blog post actually demonstrating and, um, and, and a video screencast actually demonstrating how you can actually build your own uh, website where, where you can host your own blog in under an hour. Um, I've had a lot of people who have done this um, who actually have, no, actually have no experience whatsoever with R. It may be taking them an hour and a half. But it is possible to do that. So if you're interested, um, check out my blog, DS Quintana blog and you can actually see step, super easy step-by-step -step instructions that people even without any experience with R can do for setting these, own, these things up. And I would argue even, even if you're not doing a blog, every single PhD student should have their own website. I know that a lot of people have their institutions setting up pages for them, but you have very little control over what's shown there. So I'd highly recommend that every single PhD student have their own website. If you don't think people are Googling you, you're kidding yourself. People are Googling you. Reviewers, when they get a paper coming in, who, who, who's this author? They will Google you. What are they going to find? By having your own website, you can help control what they're going to find when it comes to your publications, when it comes to your research. So I'd highly recommend um, doing this um, when it comes to building your own website. OK, now on the next thing, preprint, uh, open code, and data. Um, one thing I... Um, I can be a little bit over-optimistic sometimes. And maybe a year ago, I would say, yeah, just, just put your preprint on Twitter. It'll be great. Like, people will come. People will read it. It'll be fantastic. But then people will like, well, what if you only have like 10 or 15 followers? People aren't going to do it. And I'm like, that's actually a, a really good point. And I, I, I tested this. And basically, I was, I was, at, at, a work, I was, I was at, at a workshop um, uh, a few months ago. And I said, oh, anyone have under sort of 50, 50 Twitter followers, and so I put the hand up, and I'm like, can I do a little, little experiment? And I, I got them to ask a question on Twitter to see, just to demonstrate, even people with, with, with less, less than 50 followers can get their answers, questions answered, um, but it didn't work. Um, so it was, it's, it's true, like, it, it, was a, it was a learning experience. But one thing that you can do with preprints is you can post it, of course, um, but um, just if you're actually wanting to get the opinion from other people, just send them an email. And what works really well is if you're actually citing them in the paper. You might say, hey, I've written a preprint. Um, I've cited your work. Um, could actually check, have I interpreted your work correctly? The amount of times that I've seen a citation of some of my papers and noticed, oh, they've miscited it. Um, if, the, if only I actually read a preprint, I could have said, hey, you've actually um, miscited my paper. They can actually change it before it gets published. Now it's published. Uh, I'm not going to tell them to do, to do a correction if they've misinterpreted my um, my, my, my paper in a small way, way, but it's much better to do it at a preprint stage. So if you have a preprint and you want to get feedback, just ask people. Just ask them, hey, would you mind doing that? The worst they're going to do is not reply or say no. So that kind of gets around this whole problem of how can I actually get people to find my preprint um, if um, I don't have a lot of people who are actually um, reading these things. So highly recommend, just ask people. Um, I've done it as well myself. Some preprints don't get, don't get much attention, and there are people there where I genuinely want to know, have I actually interpreted your work correctly? And they've emailed them, and then like, people are like, wow, this is amazing. Thanks for letting me clarify my work. And they've spent a lot of time actually doing that. 
Um, okay, so when it comes to actually um, posting your preprints and your code online, I think there are three things to look, to look out for when it comes to the platform. Firstly, does the platform have a longevity plan? Is it gonna be around for, for, for more than sort of 50 years? Um, a lot of platforms out there, um, we, we, because they're not for profit, we have no idea, no idea where they're gonna be. Um, ResearchGate in academia, for instance, a lot of people are posting their work on there as the only way of actually having their preprints. I don't think it's a bit puzzling. We don't know where, those, where that work's gonna be in the future. So always have a look at the platforms. Do they have a longevity plan? What happens if their funding runs out tomorrow? Are they, are they actually gonna be around in the next 50 years? Um, is a platform non-profit, like I mentioned before? You wanna actually figure out the motives. I wouldn't be surprised if, if ResearchGate gets bought out by Elsevier in a year's time. That, that's what they're aiming for, to be honest, when you get all those annoying emails. Think about that. And finally, is it easy to use? Um, I know a, a lot of universities have their own platforms and it's fantastic they're doing this, but some of these platforms are really hard to use. So um, that, that's another consideration. And there's a few platforms that actually fit this bill. Um, one of them is Framework, which we heard about in our earlier presentation. And the thing I like about Open Science Framework is that it actually, it thinks about the whole life cycle of research when it comes to organizing your research, collaborating with people, posting your, posting your preprints, posting your pre-registrations, um, posting your code, all these things, and, and publishing your final reports. So, report. so I really like Open Science Framework because you can actually go across the whole life cycle. And they've got some great um, um, resources of how to use it, and there's a lot of great tutorials online. So I would highly recommend when it comes to posting your work, posting your code, of checking out Open Science Framework. They, they tick all those boxes. They have a long-term plan. They're gonna be around at least for the next 50 years, if not longer. Um, it's super easy to use, and it's a non-profit, so I'd, I'd recommend that. Um, one thing I often hear is there are people who are like coding zealots. They're like, you have to use R, you have to use Python or nothing um, when it comes to reproducibility. Um, it helps, but this isn't necessarily the case. Um, there are two fantastic options uh, for posting um, or, or, or for sharing reproducible analyses, um, JASP and Jamovi. Um, here's an example of JASP. When you upload your JASP file to Open Science Framework, all the analysis comes up, so you can see exactly how someone has done their work. And within that file, you can also extract the data as well. Uh, I believe Jamovi does something similar, um, but when you're actually sharing your files in this way, it's, it's a fantastic way of actually sharing your files with, without necessarily learning how to code. I, I have a few, um, I supervise uh, a few research students, but I also supervise a few clinical psychology students. And I know they're not gonna have a long-term career in research, they, they, they tell me that. So I don't, I don't tell them they should learn R, um, but I say, hey, you're gonna be doing your analyses, do it in JASP, do it in Jamovi, so you can actually share it and you can still make sure that it's reproducible. So this is a, a great alternative if you don't know how to code or if you're not gonna have a long-term research. So a, a, a quite a big issue and one of the biggest impediments for sharing your data is, well, okay, there, there are privacy concerns. Um, quite often I speak with people and they're like, you should be sharing your data. Everyone should share their data and I ask them, well, what research do you do? I do psychophysics. I, I look at reaction times. I'm like, well, no one, no one cares. No one cares about, about if you're sharing that data. Um, that, 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 that in, in the sense of privacy, those participants don't care because that's not, it's not a privacy issue. But for me, I, I, I work with, with adults with, with autism um, in the Oslo area, and Oslo is a small town, there isn't that many. So it's very difficult to actually share that data while at the same time thinking about their privacy. So this is a, a legitimate concern, but there is a way around this. Um, but first, I, I wanna talk about the benefits of sharing data. Uh, first, it's the, the verification of your analyses, so that other people can actually verify um, how you got to your results, which is really important. Uh, the second is generation of new knowledge um, somebody might, might actually look at your data and go, hey, I think you missed something. Um, if you look at these variables, you're gonna find, find X, Y, Z. That's an important thing as well. And also um, the generation of new hypotheses. If you look at a data set, do some exploratory work, you can say, cool, um, in an exploratory sense, we found this, the next study should look at that. So these are sort of the, the three benefits of sharing data, which at the moment for a lot of clinical work and a lot of work that we're not sharing due to privacy concerns uh, isn't happening. But we have a solution and it is called SynthPop. This is a cool R package with a cool name. Um, the reason it's called SynthPop is it's shortened for uh, synthetic populations. And what this does is that it creates a data set or a synthetic data set that mimics the same statistical properties as the original data set. So 
it solves these three issues in the sense that you can release the synthetic data and other people can verify the analyses because you're gonna get the same outcomes as the original data. People can still generate new knowledge because they can, they can work on that data and they can also generate new hypotheses based on the synthetic data sets. This stuff is absolutely magic. And at the moment, it's only being used in census data. So let's say people want to look at educational outcomes on like a country level and they're sharing data that way. Um, but it's only being used in like one or two psychology papers. And I think there's enormous potential uh, for this to be used uh, within, um, within ac across all the, the, the biosciences. It's super simple. Even if you're a newbie in R, you can do this. It's a very simple function of basically creating this synthetic data set. That's it. That's the code. You import your data set and bam, it creates your synthetic data set. Um, but this is just the, the straightforward analysis. So essentially what it does is it, it, it creates, so you have this, um, you have a, the original data set with a whole set of variables and the synthetic data set is um, all these variables here, um, Still, you still get the same um, summary statistics, the same standard deviations, the same averages, all this kind of stuff, the same confidence intervals, and more importantly, importantly, these, these variables are all related in the same way as the original data set as well. So you can rerun the analysis and you're still gonna get the same sort of outcomes. So it solves how you're actually gonna be doing this. And basically, to give an example, um, this is the, um, the, the light blue is the original data set and the dark blue is the observed data set, and you can see with this synthetic data set, the, the frequencies are almost exactly the same. So this is completely new data. No individual data set represents a real person, but you still get exactly, get exactly the same properties here. And when you run regressions here, you can actually see that the, the confidence intervals and the estimates are almost exactly the same. So you can actually share this data without, but, and, and actually have the, the benefits of sharing data while at the same time maintaining participant privacy. It's fantastic. I've, I've written a tutorial, which is currently under review, um, but you can actually go through that and you can step-by-step step show you how to create your own synthetic data sets for, for sharing your work. And yeah, here it is. Here is the preprint where you can do that. And by the way, the slides are on an open science framework and the link is gonna be at the end if you're interested as well. Okay, um, I, as you can tell by my accent, um, I, I grew up in Australia. Um, um, this, is, this is Bondi Beach, and uh, so I've, I've moved from 30 degrees in Sydney to, to minus five in, in Norway. Sometimes I, I question my, <laughs> my choices, but no, Norway's fantastic. Um, but this, this is where I grew up, and when we were growing up, um, quite often we'd have people coming from, coming from overseas, and they'd, they'd, they'd come to visit, and they're like, well, I, I want to go to the beach, but I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit worried about, um, about getting, getting stung by jellyfish or, get it, or worried about getting eaten by sharks. Um, but I mean, the, the, the risk is, is extremely rare, so of course it's 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 theor theoretically possible that yeah you know sure you can get stung by a jellyfish and it might it might sting for a bit, um, but these things in most beaches uh, are, are incredibly rare, and I think it's exactly the same when it comes to data scooping, which which is a concern that a lot of people have that oh, I, I don't want to post my work, I don't want to post my preprint because people are going to steal my ideas or they're going to steal my data, and and look um, time and time again people have asked this question. Who can actually tell me who's had their data scooped? And I think I've only ever seen, I think someone had, a someone had a competition. I'll send a bottle of whiskey to someone who tells me that their data that they pre-printed or their ideas they pre-printed has been stolen. No one has taken anyone up on that, on that. But I still, I think I've heard one story where this has actually happened. But the thing is, doing it is the dumbest crime. If you're stealing someone's data who's already posted it and putting it as your own, it's very obvious what you've done. You're doing it in full, public view. So I think this risk is incredibly overblown. If someone wants to do that, fine, but they're gonna completely ruin their reputation. So I think this idea of having your ideas stolen or this idea of having your data, st data stolen, while it's theoretically possible, uh, even though it's, 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 it's the, the, the chances are very small, um, it's, it's not gonna happen. Even if it does, um, everyone can see that it's, that it's happened precisely. Um, there, there was, and there was a recent study that came out that, okay, let's, let's, just, say, let's just say you actually do get scooped. Um, this particular data was in uh, the biological sciences where a lot of people are working on very specific problems <clears throat> and sometimes they're working on the same problems and someone might publish their paper a few months before the, 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 the competing team. And, and basically, um, even if people get scooped in that fashion, um, the actual amount of citations that you lose is actually quite small. So 
the chances of getting scooped are tiny, but even if it does happen, the, 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 the consequences are, are incredibly small. Um, so yeah, that's a nice little uh, preprint that came out, I think about, about two weeks ago. So to, to, to wrap up, um, we, know, we know academia is, is full of uncertainty. We, we don't know where we're going to be working um, in, in, in a few years' time. We don't know whether how well our paper is going to be received. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have not much control over. But by actually adopting the, the fast feedback principle, we can help reduce this, reduce this uncertainty as much as possible. So we can get feedback and so we can actually understand what is the best use of my time? What should I be working on? Um, and by doing this, we can, actually, or we can actually adopt open science principles and transparency in order to get faster feedback on our work. Thank you very much, guys, for this uh, really insightful talk. Um, yeah, also very motivating, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we should start with the questions. Uh, I'll just raise the cube here. It's a microphone cube. Don't be afraid. You can just speak in it, and you can also throw it away. So <laughs> cannot be, cannot break. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Like this? Yeah, is it? Uh, um, thank you very much for the, the talk. Um, I also have profited enormously from Twitter, by especially by learning what people are doing and, and learning new things I would never uh, come across from any other platform. So I see the utility in it. Uh, but I have some concerns uh, uh, about it. For example, uh, the rise of superstar uh, researchers that uh, uh, gain a lot of following, yeah. and whose opinions and arguments are taken uh, as, as truth, as, yeah. as absolute truth, yeah. and creates kind of a, a mob mentality. So yeah. this exists uh, already, uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, I think there was a recent discussion uh, regarding a, uh, you probably know this, uh, a, a, a pre-registration <laughs> paper, yeah. Yeah. which uh, uh, showed some of the, the, the issues of having a big Twitter followers and having yeah. people who defend fiercely one group over the other and on both sides. So mm. what would happen, and Twitter mobs do happen, but at least in this context, it's transparent. Um, people can actually see these discussions happening in real time. Um, quite often, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of these decisions on like, you know, whose side are we going to take happens behind um, invitation only dinners at conferences. You know, on Twitter, we can actually see this happen. We can see this happen in real time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I do see it. Uh, I, I do see it uh, as an issue that some people, you know, with large followings, what they say becomes gospel. Um, but at least they can openly be challenged. Mm -hmm. um, that, that 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 is that is possible. Um, and we can all see it happening transparently. But yeah, like, um, but you know, things need to be civil, and things sometimes become, um, you know, go go horribly wrong. I, I, I agree there. Um, but at the same time, at least with this, it's transparent and we can all see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, where? Um, oh! <laughs> Okay. By, okay. by sending letters and distributing their results and, you know, meeting regularly to discuss and so on. It was not as fast as the internet, for sure, yeah. but much faster than the uh, uh, journal process, uh, the top journals uh, would take. So uh, the, I would consider them super, uh, the top journals uh, would take. So uh, the, I would consider them super fast, given their uh, technical um, but that is only uh, more, more like a summary. But yeah. I have two comments which are more uh, aiming on context. One okay. context, I think, is the quality of the researcher, yep. and the other is the type of research. Uh, let me start with the second. We had this discussion here uh, a 
about what can happen when you, uh, you know, talk about certain research. Um, and I think it has to do with how radical your research is. Mm. I, I would be not afraid to Twitter and do everything uh, if it is moderate, uh, uh, moderately innovative. With a very innovative research, um, maybe pushing the boundary, I would be afraid of okay. uh, putting this out additional credibility kind of lended by a journal or lended by a, by a book publisher just because certain people may shred the stuff before it's even read. Um, that is one thing. <coughs> and, and, and the second is the researcher. There are introvert people who are not as good in cell marketing. Yep. Um, extrovert people like you and me and so on find it easier. Oh, I'm, I'm an extrovert. I'm, 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 I'm terrified standing here. <laughs> I, I'm not an extrovert. I'm terrified standing here. I can assure you. Well, but, but, but nobody realizes. Uh, <laughs> and and, and what, I, what, I, what I mean is that uh, some people are not as good with that. Yeah. Um, they find it hard, you know, coming up with cool stories about their life twice a day because they find their, personally find their life boring and, and, yeah. and uh, maybe uh, not as exciting to share. And, and that's a bit of the issue. So I think it's two context factors. What kind of research are we talking about? Um, as, as for the personality thing, um, yeah, I, I think quite a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to self-promote, but I think it's more about promoting your research rather than yourself. And I think if we sort of restrict it more about, well, um, if, if we rebrand self-promotion to, to, to reputation, like that this, like, this is what I actually want to be known for when it comes to my research, um, that's a definite thing. But when you're actually submitting to publications, you, you, you're doing exactly the same thing. And I think that, it's up to you as to how much personal stuff you're sharing. You don't have to share about you know, you know, what, what you did during your day. Some people like doing that and that's fine. Um, other times it could just be about, about your research process, but I do completely research process, but I do completely understand there are different personalities and uh, some people don't want to share personal stuff and that's fine and you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, as for the, uh, the, the, the first comment when it comes to controversial research, yeah, I agree. Um, some things, uh, for example, the example that was, that was brought up before, um, when it came to this idea that um, at best there was a very inflammatory title, but they made some very good points within the paper, but there was a lot of discussion back and forth about this. But the thing is, th th this paper is going to get published eventually, um, but I do agree that still there can be a, a mentality there, but like I said before, at least we have transparency, and before quite a lot of fringe ideas would never see the light of day um, once before, quite a lot of fringe ideas would never see the light of day um, once smart centre journals um, but at least with the opportunity with, with blog posts and with preprints, people can do that. But I, 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 do, I do take your point there. Um, but it might, might go this way or that way. With yeah. Controversial research. Yeah. So either it's shredded before people even read it or it's fixed, it overcomes the hurdles uh, of some of the journals. But, but, but to, ju just the other point, you recommended uh, uh, to talk about the process and not only about the result. Yes. Yeah. That was the point I was, you know, picking on. Okay. Uh, um, with uh, respect to the personality, right? Yeah, but what I'm talking about... Process, kind of. Yeah, and, and that's more in respect of like, oh, I found a really cool R package that helps me with my analysis rather than like a personal, I'm having a tough day because of this analysis, then it can be, here's a nice R, here's a nice R package that I, that, that, that I found. So that, that's kind of more what I was getting at. But I, I do understand what you're saying. Okay, thank yeah, you. yeah. Okay, I'll go to this, uh, I'll go to this, uh, see if it works. Uh, my question... This, this doesn't work. Yeah, okay, just, okay. yeah, lab, lab voice, yeah. <laughs> okay, so my question is, or maybe it, this is also more nice as the two previous questions, especially in fact, um, or like in light of the fact that uh, we're, most people sitting here are early career researchers. Yeah. And um, some things can still very much harm our careers. And some preprints, especially when they are contributing to, uh, contributing to debates that might be a bit ideologically toned, can actually, I, I think, be harmful because uh, at some point uh, uh, the potential reviewers or editors will look at Twitter, will look at the preprint platforms and will find them and then will find those negative comments. And it's not like everyone who's commenting in your preprint knows exactly what they're talking about or like really read what you wrote. Yeah. Or it's not like the reviewers always know the subject. 
And just having a lot of negativity under there is not always productive. Like I agree with the point that it's better to know some, that you did something wrong before, yeah. but it's, it's not always that you did something wrong per se. So um, I think it's a little bit unfair to talk about all of this just in like um, in this positive tone, like this is all great. Like this is good, but yeah. I think um, we do have to highlight the um, dangers of it for especially for yeah. for especially for yeah. early career um, researchers. And I, I just wonder what's your take on that, and maybe what your advice would be if uh, something like that happens. Yeah, um, I, I, I wish more editors were checking preprints because they're, they're not, <laughs> and I wish more editors were on social media, um, but not not many are doing that. Um, the thing is, if you, if you really hit a manuscript publication anyway, um, but I do get that. Um, if a reviewer happens to be reading something online and they see the comments, then that may, that may put something in a, in a particular light. Um, but, um, but look, I think overall that, that, that's going to happen. That's going to happen when it comes to uh, happen. That's going to happen when it comes to um, um, uh, published research. And we always have to consider um, f for most initiatives, um, for most reforms, in, in some respects, there's going to be some potential downsides. And I don't think, um, look, I'm, I'm not saying that we should be advocating for, for abusing people online, Ab absolutely not. Um, um, we, we should have sort of critical debate online, but at the same time, we shouldn't let um, critiques um, or, or worry about critique um, stop this, uh, the, the innovation of, of, of preprints. Um, but I think for early career researchers, the, the, the benefits far outweigh the, um, uh, the disadvantages and the, ex and the examples of people, like there are, um, there are hundreds of preprints posted every day, and maybe like three, three or four a year will actually have this a lot of debate ar around them. So I think this fear is a little bit unfounded, um, but it is a legitimate fear. Um, and um, but look, the, yeah, I think the benefits, the, yeah, I think the benefits outweigh any, any potential dis disadvantages there. Uh, thank, that was, thank you, that was a great talk. I have a question about uh, feedback on software development because you actually started your talk with this as, a, as an example and you also yeah. mentioned uh, sharing, for example, um, to get feedback on. Um, and I wondered, um, so if you, I guess if you consider maybe more complex analyses than like in any programming languages, um, if you have any experience that you could share on code review, so either publicly, basically, that you can invite people to, review. if you can't or don't want to share it, basically have a culture within that, that people kind of, that colleagues basically review your code and run your analyses and see if it's reproducible, um, et cetera, et cetera, and if the analysis themselves make sense. Because I think, I mean, analysis can sometimes be a, a huge part of the mm. project, right? And then, huge part of the mm. project, right? And then, with a lot of different analyses, um, at least I'm constantly worried that there's like a huge bug I'm kind of overlooking that will um, kind of, yeah, impair the conclusions of the results, so. Yeah, um, that, yeah. That's, that, that's legit. Um, a new service was la launched yesterday called Coos. I, I have this code in this field of research. Um, can I find a buddy to review it for me? And then you pay the favor back in a later time. Um, I think that's fantastic. There are ways um, within labs they can do that as well, where you can sort of find a code buddy. In Silicon Valley, that's what they always do. They always have a code partner to, to, to check these things. And finally, um, some journals are actually, um, some journals are actually now hiring a code person. Uh, Metapsychology, um, the, the online journal, um, now has somebody who actually checks the code. They don't check whether it's the most appropriate analysis, but they check that the code actually works. Um, but yeah, I'd highly recommend doing that. Um, and yeah, I've had people correct me on my code that I post online. Um, nothing was incredibly wrong, but they were like, oh, you, um, so it, it can be really useful. Um, so yeah, but I'd, yeah, I'd highly recommend doing like, getting people to check your code, it's, re it's really important. Yes? Yeah. And that tends to lend itself to extreme responses because that yep. means you have to get attention. I agree. I think we as researchers should be careful about adopting practices that kind of in them might lead to um, some of the comments earlier about you know the way that some researchers kind of get more attention or some type of research kind of stops. 
Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, in the eight stages of publication, where you have what you do, the preprint stage, um, and it also has a pre register stage, and you get feedback. The idea is that you get feedback at each stage, at each stage. And the final publication is the entire process, not wow. just one step. I like that. And it's, it's an interesting project, and you know, I think it's really good. So. I'll check it out. Um, but yeah, as, as for the algorithm, um, I think the thing I like about like preprint services, like there's, there's no such thing. Like it's it's, it's all out there. Um, but of course, with Twitter, uh, Facebook's hot like that. Um, so there's no way of controlling anything. But with Twitter, it's not as bad. But it, it is getting worse, and I do agree. Uh, things that get um, more more comments or ratioed get get driven to the top, and and more extreme comments and more extreme views do do get driven. So that's yeah, there there, there are risks there. I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it depends. It depends. It depends on the field that you're in. Uh, of course, there are some fields um, where some journals um, don't accept don't accept this. Um, so you have to consider that. Um, uh, but I mean, at the same time, you have to think about: is is it worth doing that, or is it worth sort of not submitting to a particular journal uh, for that reason? I know, at least within the biomedical sciences, there's maybe like two, there's maybe like two journals which don't actually don't actually accept preprints. Um, so yeah, that that could be a problem, and it is worth considering from from the outset. Um, so yeah, no, I, I do agree. Um, but I mean, like, I, I don't think a blog post would constitute pre-publication. A pre-print pre would, but a no, no, that, that's not your question. But uh, if you, or, or my question at least was more about like share, yeah. like get feedback on which channel do you. Oh, okay. I mean, it is. It, if it's if it's a quick idea that you can do over Twitter, then just you just try that to see if your colleagues or see if people actually find it interesting. If you want to develop it a bit more, it's a it's a time thing. If you want a quick feedback, Twitter. If you want a bit more longer, then you would expand it to a, to, to a blog post, for instance. But it also depends on the sort of the sort of work that it is. It also depends on the sort of the sort of work that it is. Um, but uh, just just try both. Try see see how it works. Quest questions. Yes. Um, so I'm in particle astrophysics, <laughs> so it's a bit different, but. Um, for us, I mean, we work in huge collaborations, so yeah. we work in a collaboration of 150 people, and this stage of, um, yeah, talking about the process of your work is kind of already happening within our collaboration all the time, because yeah. we start with an idea and we get feedback from other collaborators. Mm. At the same time, we have, there are only, we have, there are only like, in total, there are three instruments on the planet that can do what we do. <laughs> You're not getting scoops. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we take care of, take, keeping what we do inside the collaboration secret yeah. because we also want a kind of independent confirmation on our results from these other instruments. So yep. my, question, yep. my question is kind of, is this a concern for you um, if you talk about every single thing that you're doing during your process that people, if, if they want to confirm what you're doing or your study that you're doing, are just going to copy what you did instead of doing an independent task? Or is it independent enough because they have different patients that what you've raised is for, for your field will definitely be an issue, uh, at, at least for, for me with different patients. Like I, I want to have two different types of confirmation, at least a, um, a conceptual replication that someone tried the, the general idea in a different pa patient population group, um, but also a, a more formal replication where someone does exactly the same methods. So I would welcome that, but of course, I would welcome that, but of course I understand your situation um, where you, you, you want to keep these things under wraps because um, because of your field, then that, that, that's a different situation. But uh, no, it's good to hear that perspective. Yes. I I use the Pomodoro technique.
so I basically do my work, I turn off the internet for 40 minutes, um, and then I work, I write, I code, and then I take a break for 10 minutes, and that's when I use social media. Do that, check a few things, post a few things, a few things, hop off. Uh, that's it. Um, yeah. But I, uh, th and that's all the time that I take. Oh, I mean, like you, you know, I, I do like a, I do like a sort of a, a seven-hour day. So, so, so within that, maybe it'd be sort of like a, a half an hour, an hour, and it seems like a lot, half an hour, an hour, and it seems like a lot, but I think it's important. And uh, personally, for my career, it's 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 been the best thing. So, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? No. Okay. Well, then, uh, please give a big thank you again to Dan. Thank you very much. for coming here. Thank and, you. Um, okay, so this uh, finishes the first session for today and we will now have the lunch break. Um, for